So yesterday I did my very first, well actually it was in my second IG Live. The first one I did um, the second round of the Pocky Wind Chip Challenge. Woo! Is it hotter than the last one? You know what, I think it's still, there's a little burning of the lips, but man, like every time I, I, like the first time I did this, I was almost like frightened. But yesterday was my book reading for the book release, right? So I was gonna do the IG Live, I was gonna do a little reading, and uh, answer some questions, you know, a little question and answer at the end. So I had this whole production plan that I wanted it to almost, because, um, you know, I had to do something different, right? This is who I am. But I wanted to do something that integrated the idea of kind of the feel of, of an asynchronous video where you're able to do editing, you're able to put, you know, music in and things like that. But I was like, okay, that's cool. But, like, what is... What makes this really interesting? And this is when I kind of came up with the idea of um, reinvigorating a, a character that I had invented when I first started, you know, creating content back in really 2008. So I will uh, give you a little clip of that. Hold on, hold on a second. Put it, put it down right there. Okay, you can leave. Okay, I appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. At this point is when I'm walking in and I created this little song for the beginning for the intro. And, and there's like three different little song cl sound clips, if you will. But I created this song based on the different types of music that I listened to while I wrote, like my writing and write, you know, hours and hours of writing. You ask anybody who's written a book, it's a lot of sitting and a lot of writing. And what really kind of gets the juices flowing for me is Indian music, Indian instrumental music, tabla drums especially, um, djembe drums and didgeridoo music. A lot of instrumentals, you don't want words flowing because you're trying to come up with words. Former. I am a seeker of truth, a purveyor of compassion. I understand life by immersing in it, I understand myself by immersing in me. I grow the most when my personal struggles reach their highest elevation. I am on my multidimensional work in progress. I am ready, willing, and able to put in the work with a commitment to bringing others along with me. One peg, one hold at a time. Indoor rock climbing is a surprisingly appropriate analogy for understanding how thought expansion can occur over time. My first experience engaging in this activity taught me a lot. While there are no actual rocks, what climbers use to move up and down the walls are fabricated pegs and holds. They are fixed to tall vertical walls that twist and turn and sometimes become horizontal. The pegs and holds are color-coded by degree of difficulty. So you know, at this point is when, oh man, the uh, teleprompter, you know, I'm setting this thing up and the teleprompter, it's, it's automatic, but uh, I wish I had a foot pedal or something because I could not find the right speed. It was either too slow or too fast. When you first approach the wall, you study the problem, the term used to describe the particular path you'll be taking up the wall. Like a game of chess, you strategize subsequent moves in order to make the vertical ascension. 
These thoughts are all being carefully processed long before you've made any physical contact with the wall. You can gain an advantage by watching another person climb, examining intensely where they succeed and where they fail. Repeatedly, they'll lose their grip or their footing and they'll plummet to the padded cushions below. A great deal can be learned through astute observation, which is something we take for granted, but do all the time. There will be no moments in time where there's no one else around for you to observe, so you must scale the wall alone and learn from your own successes and failures. And when you finally make it, you'll find yourself with a prodigious and ecstatic feeling of accomplishment. We should consider approaching new ideas in the same way, using a scaffolded approach. Whether rigidly constructed or creatively spontaneous, as in the serendipitous nature of each day, we continually build knowledge on a scaffold that has already been constructed. And for some, the foundation of the scaffolding is incredibly strong, resilient, and flexible, allowing for vast amounts of knowledge to be amassed. But for others, the foundation is weak, inflexible, and unstable, and needs to be repaired or even rebuilt. This challenge takes a tremendous amount of time and effort and can be highly frustrating, even painful, like the muscles the day after climbing, but it's necessary for our intellectual, emotional, and spiritual evolution. Selfdom and the stronghold of the ego. The word ego means different things to different people can be grossly misinterpreted depending upon the context of its usage. For example, in college, I learned of the work of Sigmund Freud in psychology classes. I understood the ego to be one of three dimensions of the personality accompanying the id and superego. In this context, the ego functions to regulate the impulsiveness of the id. You know, we're of ear, id driven thoughts, and these behaviors have been deemed socially acceptable. I'm also aware of the everyday commonly understood meaning of ego that manifests itself in people who exhibit a high degree of self-centeredness, big headedness, and egocentrism. If a person would be described as having an inflated ego, they may have a tendency to demonstrate behaviors that consistently fail to take into account how others may be impacted. A large ego might also play out as a demonstrated lack of desire to intervene in situations where one's help is needed if that action will not result in personal gain. Another manifestation of this type of ego brings with it the crushing impact of rejection. Where I live, many people are pursuing serial opportunities which result in enormous amounts of rejection, of which I, as a commercial actor, can relate to quite well. There's only one role and 300 people audition, only one of those 300 people will be cast. It's simple math. Rejection is also common in the literary world, the art world, any other sphere where your uniqueness could be potentially rewarded so long as it's the right kind at the right time. People who are more experienced will tell you you'll have innumerable rejections throughout your lifetime, so learn to handle them gracefully. It's critically important for maintaining your value and self-worth. It's always good practice to leave your ego at the door whenever you walk into situation as well as when you exit. Yes, this is a sting of disappointment. It does happen and can happen frequently and it can feel pretty bad. But I want you to try to sit with those emotions. Look them in the proverbial face. Connect to that place where the root of that emotion lies. Remove the storyline and allow it to dissipate and eventually dissolve because it will. This is not the same as repressing it or sucking it up and moving on. It's an active process when undertaking can reveal how attached you truly are to your ego. My current understanding of the interpretation of the concept of ego has grown to include what I've learned from Buddhist teachings. In this context, the ego represents the self-derived individualistic aspects of personhood that can make us feel disconnected from everything and everyone, even our spouses, our partners, and our friends. But it's much bigger than that, however. The macro-level disconnectedness both acknowledged and bring into question our place in the totality of existence itself, not merely in the context of our interpersonal relationships. This disconnectedness can leave people feeling existentially empty, and so many find themselves becoming attached to objects, ideologies, or mind-altering substances as coping mechanisms for their melancholy. They can even become obsessively attached to other people in unhealthy ways. Does individualism cause us to linger far away from our human roots of collective consciousness, empathy, compassion, and group accountability? The stronghold of the ego strengthens its grip on us as we attempt to move away from its clutches. Being overly attached to your ego will eventually cause you to suffer and will hinder your compassion from being fully developed to its full potential. Connecting ego consciousness and including this massive idea in an easy-to-digest book about seeking selfdom is a paradox. 
You see, seeking selfdom is not merely about exploring and developing one's identity, but requires the acknowledgement that it did not emerge and cannot fully develop without the ongoing presence of others. This is where individualism takes on a whole new level. We are all works of progress, and trying to figure out who we are can feel like unfair punishment, although it is by far the greatest gifts we could ever give to ourselves. Inspiration is all around you. I was in Ralph's grocery store a few months ago, and Bob Marley's Don't Worry About a Thing melodically chimed through the speakers. Of course, I had to sing along, as I always do when I hear a familiar tune that holds meaning for me, albeit discreetly. When I looked up and down the aisles, I witnessed other people quietly singing along with Bob under their breaths, almost subliminally as they shopped. It was a moment to remember, a moment for the books, which is why I shared it here, and a touching reminder that we are all connected in more ways than we realize. Such connected, shared vibrational energy amongst people can be easily distorted and concealed by the struggles of everyday life and the intentional efforts of a power elite that uses a covert divine conquer strategy as a method for maintaining their status. People need much more than motivational messages to grow, change, and make things happen for themselves. There is a strong need for self-directed, self-reflective work carried out by all people, but you must convince yourself that this is true for you as well. Part of the real self-work is admitting to some of the blind spots you have and recognizing the areas in your life where you could benefit. Seeking self them has universal implications for us all. We devote an enormous amount of time of our waking hours and activities that build and develop our physical bodies or those that help us to become more skilled in our crafts. We may spend years developing our intellectual capital and happily admit to having a ravenous appetite for reading and writing. But how many of those really dig deep into who we are as a person and what that self-perception means for us? As I approached my 40s, I wasn't particularly excited about it. On the top of my mind was the realization I was getting closer and closer to mortality, where such a pessimistic attitude originated eludes my understanding, but it's there. I needed new stimuli, experiences, and interactions to shake things up, so I decided to leap out of my comfort zone and into the world of improv. I've been taking improv classes on and off for about five years now. For me, improv has been surprisingly a therapeutic activity that successfully unveiled imperceivable complications that were hidden in my social interactions, directly challenging my problem with being fully present. In addition to taking a series of classes in sequential order, I've taken improv workshops and hip hop dialects performing improv with puppets, and each experience has offered me rare and invaluable insights about myself. However, my inability to be present has been considerably heightened when engaged in multi-person scenes that involve object work, which work can be significantly jarring to my comfort level, although there are times when I've never laughed so hard. By challenging myself through improv, I've been compelled to reach inward in a completely new and unexpected way. It has helped me to understand more about myself and further validated that my self and seeking is far from over. I still have a long way to go, and I'm completely fine with that. Perhaps you're a seeker too. Seeking self is a challenging endeavor that requires the conscious engagement of the mind to harness its innate capacity to masterfully empower itself and creatively problem solve in new ways, yielding innovative insights and empowering conceptions. Complexity in this undertaking is unnecessary as we already possess the ability to achieve an effortless flow of ideas and actively capitalize on what each new day brings. Most of us have become estranged from nature now more than ever before in human history, distanced from each other and disconnected from ourselves. Ironically, the extreme prominence of social media, our addictive preoccupation with it, and the rise of the selfie as an indelible part of our modern culture has us looking at ourselves now more than ever before. Yet most of us utterly fail to truly see ourselves. Seeking self them also involves soul searching, a process whereby individuals reach a prophetic coming to the self period of time in their lives when large unanswerable questions are grappled with. This is where it can get a bit tricky. When I use the term reality, I'm referring to the perceptual integration of all the components that make up our existence, expertly woven together in an intricate tapestry that is both adored and despised. To my understanding and interpretation, there exist four intersecting realities. 
a reality that we experience, a reality that others experience, a shared reality wherein we reach momentary experiential agreements with others, and a reality that exists outside of our field of comprehension due to the limitations of our cognitive and interpretive capabilities. That's a hell of a lot of realities to reconcile. The fourth reality acknowledges the fact that the majority of what is real and true is beyond our understanding, yet it still undeniably exists, even though it cannot be seen, felt, consciously experienced, or fully explained, and it never will. However, we can unearth the multiple complex facets of ourselves and that already exist within each and every one of us. If you're already, if you're already uh, seeking self um, or just plain curious about the ideas of what that actually means or find yourself at a place in your life where you're open to some new ideas offered by someone who is madly driven to do the same, then this book is right for you. But take it all with a grain of salt and perhaps a spoonful of organic raw honey. Approach seeking self as if you were traversing an expansive river flowing relentlessly downstream. There will be calm, serene points along the way. There will also be fiercely flowing rapids that make your adrenaline levels spike, speed up your heart rate, and mandate that you be fully present as you paddle furiously through the currents, fully committing to the great thought adventure you've chosen to embark on. All right, the, the performance is officially over, and now we're going to go to the, um, you know, to ro the roll with it kind of thing. I have uh, taken a little bit of time to prepare this, this whole production, if you will. Uh, I wanted to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, obviously, the question and answer period is really challenging in this medium. I want to talk a little bit about the book, um, and then I will uh, hopefully be able to, I got my glasses on, I'll be able to see and I'm waving at people, I'm waving back. Um, this, this, uh, writing this book has made me a little bit crazy, as you can tell, as if I needed to be a little crazier. Uh, but, but I have to tell you that I wrote the book for me first. And secondly, I wrote the book for people that I know who know me, who love me, who I love, so that they could know a little bit more about me on a deeper level. And then thirdly, I wrote the book that hopefully someone, you know, out there may find some of my ideas interesting. It, is, it has been an, an incredibly challenging struggle, and if anyone knows me, they know that's all I talk about because I really was dedicated to making it happen, and I use other people to create kind of an external accountability, not a nagging thing, but just an external accountability where people, you know, uh, look to others and put things out there and then follow, follow through with it. You know, a lot of people get stuck and uh, you know part of the dialogue in the book talks about getting stuck it's really kind of an exposition of the challenges that I faced in life uh, both at the micro level at the macro level and then being able to think more expansively but also I wanted to reach people who haven't even cracked up open the idea you know of self-development um, I've, I've, I've done a lot of self work over the last uh, 25 years, let's say 25 years. Oh yeah, today is my birthday, I, I'm 50. I am 50, 5 so instead of having a party on Zoom, which I don't really think that's my thing, that's kind of like, I don't know, it's like that porn is not like sex thing, right? So um, it's not the same for me, so either you have people in person or, or you don't have a party, but I, I committed to having this date be um, the date that I would release the book, and, you know, along the way, it's interesting because editors cost a lot of money. If you've, if you've ever written a book or not written a book, I'm just letting you know, they cost a lot of money. It is a very labor-intensive um, job to do, especially for somebody else. When you do it yourself, I did it myself. You know, in light of, of the situation, my, you know, my particular career transition situation, a particular coronavirus situa situation, um, uh, you know, employment has changed and shifted, money has shifted. I just, you know, flat out could not afford to pay for an editor. So if you're the type of person who is greatly disturbed by a few typos, in, it's probably going to, you're going to find some, I, I get it, you're going to find some. However, because it's like Kindle, uh, through uh, um, Kindle Direct Publishing, I can find these errors, you know, and change them and, and then upload the manuscript. It's print on demand. I'm not tripping on that kind of thing. To me, we get tripped up on these little things, don't we? And we, are, we don't really think about the big things. 
um, in life and the big ideas and the big ideas and how they're packaged. We just were so focused on the packaging. Uh, I'm trying to you know release myself from that social constraint and I, I use the uh, uh, idea, the concept of um, finish not perfect. So, and then that is very helpful to me, as, as is, and, and I talked about that in the book. Everything I'm pretty talking about right now, I've talked in the book. I don't think I left any very much out, you know what I'm saying? I don't think I, I left very, uh, very, very much out. Uh, see, I had got distracted because I was reading something below. I was like, I don't think... I don't think I'm good at talking and reading and then responding at the same time. But I've been talking for, for a, good, a good amount of time now. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, otherwise, um, you know, uh, if anyone have any questions, otherwise I will, um, oh, someone, there's, I thought I had to do undisturbed. Okay. The process for me was, um, it was a lonely process. It was a lonely process. Talk about social distancing. So I'm already primed and ready for this. Because I've been, you know, pretty much focused on this for the last, oh man, six months at least, and I, I've I've been writing it for about four or five years, you know, pieces. When they're sitting at home by themselves, looking at a computer screen, right? Any any questions here? Yes, life is full of typos. Yes, it is. All right, I'm 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 just waiting for people. Thank you for the birthday messages. Thank you for the waves. Um, I guess people pop in and leave. You know, y'all killing me. Anyway, how did you arrive at the title for your book? Wow, that's a good question. I like the word seeking. Um, the word seeking to me is just a perpetual process. of uh, it, You may never find it, but you're seeking it out. And seeking to me is more than looking. Looking is kind of an observational quality. Seeking is, is about exploration, it's about the process. So focus is on the process. And selfdom, when I think of selfdom, you know, I was saying the word kingdom, like kingdom. If you rule a kingdom, you're the king. If you rule over yourself, then you're, it's like a, the selfdom is, is, is that. And, and then in the age of selfies, again, kind of just exploring the idea is we look at ourselves again and again and again and get in the right light and the right angle. I mean, I did it. I had the light set up. I've been working to get this just right. But are we really seeing ourselves? You know, do we really see it deeper into ourselves? Are we just uh, looking at the presentation that we give to everybody? Oh my God, the writing process. Well, the writing process uh, occurred in various fragmented stages over the course of about five years. And probably the last two years is when I started to really buckle down. I did not start with an outline. I did not, I said, I'm not going the academic route. I have been academically trained with an artistic mind and an artist would probably not necessarily map it all out. They would just go for it. So I just started to voice, you know, I would do a, a text myself thing, copy and paste into a notes, throw into Dropbox, integrate it then start to build an outline from what came out, move things around, delete things, shift things around, all along the process. It made the process like incredibly challenging. I made it more challenging than it could ever be, probably for someone else, but it was not a linear story. Um, it's almost just like if someone pulled a bunch of their diaries or journals and put it together over time into something. And uh, why, did, why does it finally, how does it finally feel to launch um, on your 50th birthday. It's an interesting thing because I'm not able to connect with people in person and like kind of the idea was to get something physical and tangible and be able to connect with people in that way. So outside of like the current kind of strange days that we live in, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I um, got together with some, some of my friends and we did a video called Pushing 50 because I knew it was coming down the line, right? A couple of years down the line, I'm like, I'm a plan ahead guy, right? So 50 is half a century. It's like this even number, you know, the, the, the likelihood you'll ever reach another 50 is kind of, you know, not, is very improbable. So I wanted to do something different. Some people have throw all these elaborate parties, which I think I, I love to attend. Um, but I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something personal. And to be quite honest, by writing the book, I wanted to be able to move, start my 50s with a, a completely different mindset. And I think, I think that I have. 
What experience in your life would you say your ego got in the way? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I, I've learned to, um, I've learned to not be attached to my ego, but I would say, to, and it's going to go way back, was when I first graduated from college with an undergraduate degree, first person in my family kind of thing, you know, I was, I thought I was the shit because I thought everyone was going to hire me. I got this degree. I'm smart. I've been working. I, 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 how am I going to be able to handle all these, you know, all these job offers? There's ego for you, right? And then I got a big sna uh, smack in the face and um, learned, learned about life a little bit hard there. Will there be a sequel to the book? <laughs> Hell, are you going to write it for me, Shy? Oh, I can't say now. I'll never say never. But for me, I wanted to have like a foundation document, a foundation body of knowledge that can... Other things can come from it. Maybe a podcast, you know, maybe, um, you know, could, a lot of things could come from it. So it's a foundation, a foundational body of knowledge that I can uh, create numerous products from moving forward. I think that's, yeah, in a book, maybe a book is in there, but definitely I got to pay for an editor next time. I'm just saying. Will there be an audiobook or a compatible audio experience? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I love audiobooks. Um, so once I got the book done and then it's a paperback and then it's um, I got the Kindle kind of process going so there's an ebook and the next evolutionary step would definitely be the audiobook. And I would probably read the audiobook. I know it's a time intensive process, but I might I gotta find out maybe how I could do that and definitely um, want to do that because I love listening to audiobooks. When I'm in the traffic, you know, I can get a lot of books read. This is just like my like 8 a.m. Social 101 class. Like everybody's done talking now. Are you done talking? You ain't got no more questions. What time is it? Echo. What time is it? The time is 12:27 p.m. Oh, okay. So we got three minutes. I would say half an hour of your time. Some of y'all rolled in super late. You missed the whole entire beginning. You missed the reading. And then, yes, I'll be honest, my teleprompter was going too fast. I spent about a half an hour trying to adjust the right speed and get everything plugged in and charged. So, yeah, it went a little bit fast. It was, it was killing me. Plus, you know, all the dancing, I had, to get my, I had to get my breath together. What is the most important lesson you'd like readers to take from your book? Oh, that's a good question. I'd like them to take um, that you do not have to go seek out someone to help you. You can, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it at all, but you don't have to. You can do the self work yourself for free at home every single day. Every opportunity is an opportunity for a new awareness. Every single day is an opportunity to interact with someone in a different way, to look at yourself in a different way. That's the practice. It's not like I'm gonna sit down and work on myself for this hour. It's like all the time, every opportunity. Maybe we should do another one after we read the book. Yeah. Are you going to read the book? Shy. Now, yeah, let me talk about the cover, though. I'll talk about the cover, a few, few features of the book, and then if you go to my website, akellostone.com, which is also in the bio. Is it up here? The profile, it's there. Homepage, boom. Um, One-click ordering. I, um, let, me, let me get the question again. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we should do another one after we read the book. Well, one thing about the cover, I made a, I thought I made a pretty damn cool cover. I learned Illustrator just so I could do my own cover. I took my own photo um, for the back cover. I mean, this is like DIY, self, dumb, you can do it. You're, you're the ruler of your kingdom. And then you have to also, of course, be all the people that work in the kingdom at once. Um, but that's why I wanted to have a cool cover in case no one ever reads it. It looks kind of cool sitting on the coffee table, right? The other thing about the, the features of the book, which are not in the ebook because there's the formatting restrictions, is um, if you oh, pop open the, I don't always have time to read through a whole book all the time, right? I might, but there's like these text boxes, the bold text boxes that really pop out some gems. 
So maybe you flip through and just kind of read through all those. And maybe you read that gem and then you can read that particular segment in the book. So you don't necessarily, you do not have to read from beginning to end. Uh, I would definitely say read the intro and then read the last chapter. But like other stuff is as you need it. There may be something as you need it. So the text box is located on the page right next to where the content is that derives from the page. And also when I, this is, you want to hear a rookie move. So like in the rookie move was like I had, you know, I, you know, I'm an audio file. So I was like, I'm a, there's certain, as I'm reading or as I'm writing, there's certain lyrics that pop into my head, not the entire song, but certain lyrics. So I said, I'm just going to put these lyrics in the book. It'll be cool. And then I started doing, after I kind of got to a point where I need to start looking at copyright issues and things, I could not, I could not put the lyrics in there. So instead I referenced the songs by the segment where there's kind of a, a relevance there. And so you can go to the song, you can find the song, or I actually created a Spotify playlist that's in order of the songs from all kinds of eras and all kinds of genres, songs that have meant things to me, songs that like inspire what I write. And um, you can get a hard copy if you go to my website, akellostone.com, and then you'll see there's an ebook, a hard copy, and of course a Spotify playlist right there on the home page. I think there was something else I wanted to say about Oh, oh, hold on, stay right there, stay right there. <clears throat> this is actually a draft copy of the book right here. This is one of my drafts. And I do it so that I can see, you know, how it's laying out. The formatting, as you can see, this one's a little tight on the top. Um, and here is the way kind of the text box floated around. So you can kind of, plus it breaks up the monotony of, um, of a book. But if you turn to the very first page, and again, nothing is required. It's only suggested. Um, there is, oh, this is not the right copy. So just, just bump this, just scratch that idea. There is a, um, an initial illustration there's an initial illustration that has like the gorilla with um, a thought cloud right above his head when you open the book and my idea was after you've read the book I want you to go back to that page and I want you to write what um, oh no okay I want you to go to that page and I want you to write what you think uh, that gorilla might be thinking like after you've read the book Thank you for the birthday greetings. Let's see who else, who's on here. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Let's see. Oh, y'all be late. I mean, it, yo, y'all was late. Y'all missed the whole performance in the beginning. I'm, I'm just super disappointed. No, I'm not. Like the people that needed to see that, you know, uh, saw it. But we're just doing a little question and answer period until people start dropping like flies. I initially wanted to do a half an hour, but I, I don't mind doing a 45 minutes. Um, I don't know what time is it, but. Let's see. Thank you. I, uh, I'm actually um, answering questions if anyone had any more questions. It's hard to answer questions when the book has not been out. You feel me? And no one's read the book and you really have any questions. It's kind of like process questions. Oh, the song that you heard in the beginning um, with the dancing uh, Sasquatch, that was a song I made, which is a compilation of the different musical styles of music that I listen to, I have to listen to instrumental, and it's usually Indian instrumental, uh, djembe drumming, um, Indian drumming, uh, did I say didgeridoo? So like those, it's a combination of like instrumental tribal music. What's your favorite part of the book? I mean, wow. I think it's the last, I think it's the very last segment. The very last segment to me is like, you know, is I, I love watching movies. I'm a big movie watcher. And I wanted to, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, 20% power. We're still going, 20% power. Yeah, this is these uh, phones. Okay. Um, I love, okay, so I could watch a movie and it could be so good, but the ending could be so whack that it totally taints the entire book or the entire movie for me. And so I took that approach where I wanted the end to be just, you know, I want the end to, to move, move you. Um, the, the end actually moved me. It moved me when I read it. And I don't know if it was because, you know, it was my third book cover to cover edit and I finally got to the very end and 
felt like choked up about it. Uh, but it was just what I wanted. I didn't really care if there was typos and there was little things in the middle of the book because the meanings were so so complex and so heavy and so personal. But I wanted to, I really wanted to end it with a bang. It was like, you just read, the, you just wrote this book and what, how do you want it to end? And, and you know, um, it's different reading the book after you've written it. it. You know, when you're reading it for editing, it's different, but when you really get into it and really, you know, I completely understand my own thoughts, um, whether someone else does kind of not out of, it's out of my control, right? But I will tell you this, I learned so many new words. Um, the, the, my best friend was a thesaurus. And talk about, like, talk about social distancing, and I know there's some authors here in the house. Talk about social distancing when you're writing a book. There is um, a requirement of social distancing, at least and assert at the end, kind of in the end um, of the book, of, one, of the writing period, the last two months, is this, you have to, every, when you have free time, it has to be devoted to that or it will never get done. And I know that we all have things that we will never get done because we're not, you know, we're not, we're not willing to sacrifice certain areas of our life in order to get it done. There is actually in, in the end of the, towards the end of the book, in the last, in the last chapter, I don't know if it's in uh, necessarily. In, it is. Is it? It is in this. I offer because I don't. I don't believe in necessarily offering advice to people. I think you can help them see different ways and different perspectives. But I call it food for thought. And uh, of course, I reference that uh, Dion Ferris song, "Food for Thought." I don't know if you remember that song. Uh, but like things like don't um, you know refrain from avoiding discomfort and live within your means, that kind of thing. What's the balance between personal story theory and philosophy? Oh, that's an excellent question. A really, really excellent question. So remember in the beginning when I was I was talking about the river and you're going down the river and then the uh, it gets you know the current gets really rough at certain points and some points it's like chill. I kind of took that approach where I wanted to I wanted to introduce a topic in a personal way. Maybe a, I'm not a big storyteller, but I can tell a story in written word, right? where I talk about a story, I give people some visualizations, and then I start to integrate some theory, and then I, want, then I start to help re for, re restate the theory in kind of an, uh, an everyday tone when I restate the theory or theoretical concept, and then I kind of bring it, it, it to the relatability to the self. So that is kind of the pattern of each of those, and I try to inject a little humor to lighten things up so, because you can, be, when I say multidimensional, I said, you know, I'm a multidimensional person and we all are multidimensional. I mean that you can be funny and you can be serious and you can be uh, socially conscious, but you can also be wild and crazy at times. You can defy what people think of you because of your age or your race, your gender, your social, sexual orientation, any of that. You can defy what people think because you are constructing um, your own selfdom. You are constructing that. And some of that construction means deconstructing what someone else imposed upon you. Again, we're all. This is this. And the other thing um, I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, add on to that question was it was hard for me as a writer, first of all, initially to use the word I and actually personalize the writing because um, that's not academic, right? So I think I started to warm up by I would throw some. Um, I would throw some articles out here and there, like on LinkedIn, where like seven people would read them. But I did that because I wanted to start to move into being able to use I. And then I started to use we. So there's times when I'm talking about I, then I'm talking about we collectively, and then I'm talking about you. So there's a lot of I, we, you. In terms of theory, which is different, I went outside my, my field of discipline of uh, sociology and I also incorporated psychology, cosmology, neuroscience, evolutionary biology, quantum physics, um, and, and, and uh, some spirituality. I talk, about, I talk about being a spiritual agnostic. And that's something I've never like publicly, you know, you in this, in this society, you are Christian slash monotheistic unless proven otherwise. And we just kind of roll along with it. But I was like, how would I define myself in this way that people would understand? Because the idea of us always wanting labels, you know, so I was like, I got to find a label. 
people like labels, you know. So let me find a label that people don't understand or it becomes like almost a paradox. And, and, and I love that word paradox. Uh, I think Lauren Hill saying it, what a paradox. Haven't got trapped in a box in the unplugged. But anyways, I always love paradox. But it is a paradox, spiritual and agnostic, because of what people tie spirituality to religion and agnostic to, um, they kind of like move agnostic almost towards atheism. But, you know, like grab a label, everybody, and use the label. If it doesn't work, you can always put a new one on. But if you try to strip that label completely, people will not, they will not be having that. So you better find a label, make a label, use a label. How's that? Uh, this is why I'm waiting for a question. Echo, what time is it? It's 12.41 p.m. Okay. Any, any, anyone want to uh, wrap anything up in the last uh, five minutes here? By the way, those of you that have missed out, you missed out on the audio visuals. I will give you a little taste. Hold on one second. This is for the people that just joined us. I'm trying to type upside down and absolutely cannot do it. Just a minute. Just give me a second. I know you ain't doing nothing. You're probably eating. Um, I think it's also good timing to uh, not uh, have to talk about you know what all the time. Okay, so so this is my last slide here. This is where you can find the book. If you go to my website, it looks like this. And um, if there's a couple people, like I will probably stay on a little bit longer until um, it dies out. But I see some people have joined us. And uh, for those of you that are here, it's probably going to be somewhat redundant. So if you um, would like to leave, you can leave. All right, you can leave. Everybody get up and leave whenever you want. And uh, Shai, we both grossly overestimated the number of people in, in this live IG feed. <laughs> so this is the book. This is my um, not for resale proof copy. I don't have the actual copy and everything slowed down. So I probably will not get the hard copy till April 10th, but it is available here. I'm at 10% battery life. So, so I'm at 10% battery life. It goes out. Then that's what happened because like this battery life. Anybody have any questions about the book? Or um, I will just be uh, posting the entire live feed here on, on Instagram TV if you want to sort through it. But yeah, I mean, whew, I'm gonna tell you what that teleprompter was was fast. That was so fast. I know it was painful to listen to. I'm crying too. I am crying. How did you come up with the cover design and title? So I talked about this earlier. I'll repeat again. Um, I'm kind of a, well, I'll, talk, I'll add this part with the gorilla and the, and the selfie stick. And it's interesting because we want to, when we want to know ourselves a little bit more, really understand ourselves a little bit more, we usually look at primates and watch their behavior. You know, so here's a primate with a selfie stick taking a picture um, of himself but we're still not looking at ourselves. We're looking at the damn gorilla and we're standing right there in front of ourselves. We are with ourselves 24 hours a day. I like the word seeking because seeking means you will probably never find, but the process itself, it's very process specific, seeking. Seeking is like a yearning, a desire. It's like deep seated. You could be looking for your keys, but you're like, what are you doing? I'm seeking my keys. Seeking is really about ideology. It's about uh, those kind of things that, that are missing, uh, that are not material things like keys. And then the selfdom is like there's a kingdom and you're the king and you're the ruler of the kingdom. So what would you, how do you rule yourself? You would rule yourself, you would rule your selfdom. A self rules his or her selfdom. And then the selfies thing, again, is, is kind of the reference of because we look at ourselves so much when we're taking our own picture, but that we fail to see ourselves, it's that's deep, you know. And you know, even even right now during this time, people are scrambling to find different ways to continually, you know, interact with other people, whether it's through video conferencing, um, those kind of things. But because they're just, I think people don't want to take the time to like sit with themselves, you know, sit with yourself quietly underneath a tree with no device and see what comes up for you. 
I've, I've been a, um, an active meditator for about 19 years. Um, and, you know, that's what, what happens. It's not, like, people think you're like escaping, you know, escaping reality and floating on a cloud in meditation and, and all that, you know. I have not reached that point. For me, it's, it's quite, it's like quite turbulent. Uh, I'm going to say this in my book. I talk about two monkeys. Of course, we have a gorilla on the front, but I talk about two monkeys. There's a monkey that's on your back, you know, the monkey on your back which are things that we haven't, the unresolved things that we haven't dealt with. And then there's the monkey in our mind that will not stop running around screaming wildly. And so it's not about shutting the monkey up completely. It's about, you know, selective attention and kind of quieting the monkey, uh, the monkey's voice so you're not listening to it. But it's there. I, mean, I hear the monkey. You know, it's like I hear people, like people will be, hear a siren, right? And they're like, oh my God, sirens. And I'm like, it's a siren. It's a helicopter. It's noise. But they would immediately lose their focus on that. And so really for me, that's what meditation is about. And um, I don't know. Let's see. All right. So we're just taking some questions. For those of you that missed the beginning, which happened at 12 p.m., very much on time, um, I will put that, um, yeah, the monkey mind is real, you know. Everything in the book is real, to me at least, and maybe relatable to some people, but maybe not. It's definitely real to me. There's nothing that I put in there just because, oh, I think people want to hear this, you know. It's just this. It's like, it's kind of, you know, I always tell people, like if you come over to eat at my house, I'll be cooking what I like to eat. And if you like it, then it's all good. But I'm not going to cook you something that you like. You have to eat what I like. Now, there's compromises that can be made. But overall, you know, that's the way that it should be. Represent yourself. You know, spread yourself into the world as you are. Fix what you can and uh, deal with what you can while you're here. I feel like I'm on CNN right now for some reason. This is where I'm quietly waiting for the, um, oh, 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 okay. See, I want to see if I missed anything that I was talking about. I think I pretty much, um, I'm going to read you the, just the chapter titles, which probably have changed since, 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 I'm not even going to read it because of things. I think this is like an old copy. This is an old copy. It's a nice five by eight, can fit in your wallet, it can fit in your man purse. And if you have a big jeans, it can fit in your back pocket. Make sure to put your name inside in case someone finds it and number where you can be contacted. I don't know if I can say anything here. I'm, I'm going to put up. Uh, oh, no, I, I thought I could maybe type something, but it's so weird. It's like a one way conversation. You know, I feel like I'm on the International Space Station and like 15 minutes later, you, you'll get my message. Um, but if there are no further questions, I am going to begin celebrating my birthday and probably dig in some dirt and, um, you know, a host of other things that I, I may uh, partake in to celebrate uh this day but thank you so much we have eight people left and thank you so much for coming to the first ever instagram live book release of seeking self in the age of selfies and um, even though it's not the real thing i sure had a lot of fun i hope you did as well thank you thank you so much everybody peace happiness love all that shit.